I am. I'm John, and uh, originally I am from Minnesota, born and raised in Minnesota. Um, currently, I'm the director of Canyon Ministries, and we're located just outside of Flagstaff. Uh, we live about 20 miles west of Flagstaff, out in the middle of nowhere. And um, Canyon Ministries really is committed to, uh, ultimately the heart is what of Canyon Ministries, is committed to helping people uh, either reaffirm or gain a confidence in God's character and His Word. And know that we can trust God's word from the very first verse. You know, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. For some, that's the beginning of a fairy tale. Um, For me, uh, I would propose to you that's the beginning of a true historical account of our past. And that what we see in God's word uh, validates that. And what we see in science validates that. And um, and so, uh, through Canyon Ministries, what we do is we take people on whitewater rafting trips through the Grand Canyon. And, uh, gee, darn I have to do that. I have to call that work. Um, so <laughs> uh, we do that. We do about uh, anywhere from a dozen to 14 river trips, ranging from four days to nine days uh, through the Grand Canyon. And uh, while we're on those trips, we're engaging the canyon, uh, hiking side canyons, uh, exploring, adventuring. It's the largest white water in all of North America. Uh, it's massive. Uh, there are, are some of the largest white water that's down there, some of the tail waves of the waves that are kind of at the end of the white water are depending on the water flow that time of year, anywhere from 20 to 30 feet tall. It's big water, and it's a lot of fun. (laughs) So uh, we do that, but then we also incorporate, along that trip, we incorporate uh, formal times of instruction, helping people understand uh, the relationship that the canyon has to the the global flood that we see described in Genesis 6 through 9, and uh, so the role that it has in, in, in a young earth. Um, uh, an earth that really I believe to be more around the 6,000 year old range um, based on an awful lot of different things. And so we present that and we put that out there, a lot of just casual Q&A as well. Uh, about a year and a half ago when I became, uh, shortly after I became the director of Canyon Ministries, uh, we also started doing tours up at the Rim of Grand Canyon. So we have a bus that we use, we'll take you around to various overlooks. Uh, the canyon, help you understand what it is that you're seeing, and uh, get a, a, a bird's eye view of the, of the canyon. Um, and so incorporate the two, and we're starting to work toward being able to do commercial hikes into the canyon. We do that already a little bit, kind of casually, uh, but there's just a lot of paperwork to do it fully commercially, and so we're, we're working our way through that. Uh, and then just uh, northern Arizona as a whole. But I've been, I've been a wilderness guide uh, since 1992. Um, traveling around the world, um, and so all of it for ministry purposes. In 1999, my wife and I started a ministry in northern Minnesota called Glory View, and uh, so we guided along the Canadian uh, and Minnesota border up in an area called the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness, and, and down the Dominican Republic we'd lead uh, uh, what we call adventure mission trips down to the Dominican Republic, and so I've been down there, I don't know, 45, 50 times, something like that. And also Glacier, Yellowstone, Canadian Rockies, all over. All of it, though, for the purpose of proclaiming God, not proclaiming nature. Romans tells us that the Gentiles became futile in their thinking. Right? There, was a, there was a problem. They stopped short of where they were headed. They were on the right path, but rather than going all the way to the finish and worshiping the Creator, they stopped and worshiped creation. And, um, and so everything that I've been about in the wilderness has been about to help people be able to have confidence in the Creator, worship the Creator, and know that... Uh, like Romans chapter 1 tells us, that the invisible qualities of God are made plain to us the way He reveals Himself through creation. we just got to know what we're looking at. we got to know how to interpret what we're looking at. And uh, you got to have, have, right, have the right lenses. And so, this morning, I don't want to take uh, a ton of time. I know you guys got to get off. you got a lot of things going on and, and work and things of that nature. But I want to I kind of challenge you a little bit in um, your beginnings, your foundations, and, and the significance of beginning. Uh, you know, a couple of illustrations perhaps to lay some, some groundwork for that idea. Um, your homes that you live in, right? Well, the homes that you live in now, uh, when you, if, if you purchased that home, if you're living in a home that you bought, when you first did that, uh, the foundation was significant to you. You go and you investigate, and, and first perhaps the curb appeal of the home draws you in, and, and the colors and the design and the architecture and all that kind of stuff is nice. But you're smart. You know that that's kind of all window dressing. And it can be as beautiful as it wants to be up top, but what's going on underneath the ground uh, is pretty significant. And so you take time to crawl around and see whether or not there's cracks or holes or, or cave-ins in that foundation. If there is, 
No matter how beautiful it is up top, no matter how perfect it is and how the rooms are designed and all that, you kind of walk away from it, don't you? Because you don't want that to crumble. You don't want that to fall apart. But if, if you're attracted to the, to the home and, and it seems to fit and then you dig around in the foundation and you find out, hey, this is pretty solid. I think this is going to be all right. Well, then you, then you move ahead. The problem is, if we do that, once we get into our home, we just kind of get settled in. We get settled into our house. We get settled into the living. And, and, and once we've done kind of an initial investigation of, of that foundation, we tend to neglect it. You know, how, it's not like we have a regular routine of once a month or once a week crawling around underneath our house to see how our foundation is doing. Right? We kind of just kind of move on. And we don't really think about that until all of a sudden things are starting to crumble or fall apart up top. <laughs> and then we go, wait a minute, what's going on? And then we still investigate, and a lot of times it can be too late, or all of a sudden we're into some pretty costly repairs, whatever the case may be. And uh, if we had a routine of checking out the foundation of our home, some of those things could be averted. Well, the same thing is true for our lives. You know, what does your life stand on? What's the foundation of what you believe and why you believe it? What's the foundation of what your motivation day to day? All right? Um, there may be times in your life where God just really kind of knocked you down and, and said, we need to deal with this. And you looked at, you know, my life is either based on my own abilities or whatever, and so now I'm going to give my life to Christ, or, or we establish that foundation. But then, much like our homes, we get into life. We get into our schedule. We get into our business. We get into our hobbies. We get into schedules with our kids or whatever the case may be. And, and uh, all of a sudden, it's been a long time since we've really considered or thought about our foundation, what we're about. And... Um, and the book of Genesis is the foundation of the entire Bible, the entire message that God lay, lays out for us. In Genesis chapters 1 through 11, believe it or not, every single thing that we deal with in this world is answered in Genesis 1 through 11. It creates a foundation of understanding for everything that we go through, for why there's sin and disease and deformity in our world, why, why do we have the struggles that we have, what's the problem with our world, what's the solution to that problem, where did we come from, why are we here, where are we going, what are we supposed to, all of that. Why do we have various people groups, why are we spread all over the place, all those things are established for us and God says, here, let me help you. In the very beginning, let me give you a firm foundation of an understanding of how to look at life, how to interpret everything that you're seeing so that you can move on. And the same thing, his message to us, his message to us about the cross begins in the foundation of Scripture in Genesis chapters 1 through 11. And it's huge, it's significant. And if you start to mess with the beginning, if you try to tweak the beginning, everything else starts to fall apart, right? You go down and crawl underneath your house and start moving rocks around. You're going to see everything up top start to shuffle. All right? And you haven't touched that, but you moved the rocks around down below. And so if we start to mess with, and if we try to minimize the power of God in Genesis, we've just shattered His power throughout the whole thing. And so we've got to be careful what we do with the beginning. Uh, Indiana Jones fans? Anybody Indiana Jones fans in here? All right. Excellent. I'm glad at least a couple people have a clue what I'm talking about. So, my favorite Indiana Jones is the, uh, is the Last Crusade, and they're looking for the Holy Grail. All right, you guys with me? All right, and so, Indy and his father, kind of a rough relationship because his father's been so infatuated with finding the Grail, he'd never paid any attention to Indy, at least in his mind. All right, and, uh, and so, if you remember, Sean Connery played the role of, of uh, Indy's father, and he's got this journal. Right? It's this journal of everything that he's ever known and, or discovered or, or researched or everything about, this, uh, about the Holy Grail. And, um, and, and so this, that's a significant part of the whole movie. It kind of just kind of travels through the whole movie, this journal. Right? And one of the things that he has done in that journal is he's developed a map. You guys remember that? It's a really developed map. It is very, it is very specific. I mean, it even <laughs> identifies the valley of the crescent moon. This is where, right exactly where the grail is. And, and there's, there's, you know, the map is like, take 12 steps this way and turn this way and go 10 steps. I mean, it's, it's specific. But the thing is absolutely worthless to anybody. Why? Do you remember? Nope. What's that? No. Nope. Thing's worthless because it's missing one thing. They don't know where to start. They don't know where to begin. So all those details, as specific as they are, are useless. Right? Because if you don't start in the right spot, that map doesn't do you a whole lot of good. Right? The Bible has all kinds of instruction for us. It's way more than an instruction manual. 
Yeah, some people, maybe you've heard some people have used the word Bible and turned an acronym basic instructions before leaving earth. Anybody ever heard that? It kind of drives me crazy a little bit because it's so much deeper than that. But it is instruction. All right? It is instruction. But if you don't start in the right spot, the rest of it doesn't really fit. It's hard to find where it all fits and where it all comes together. And so I want to take just a, a, a little bit of time and try to express to you some of the things from Scripture that help us to be able to affirm and to know that exactly what God says in the very beginning, we can take it as it is written. We don't have to try to take ideas from this world. We don't have to try to take ideas that are based on man's observations and man's philosophy and man's logic and try to force it into God's infallible world. We just don't need to. And in fact, when you try to do that, you, it's like moving the rocks around the foundation. Every, your whole house starts to crumble. Right? The whole house starts to crumble. Um, so we're going to start there. Depending on how much time, what your questions are today, um, we can also deal with just some specific science stuff and some things, geology stuff from the canyon, if we've got time for that. And I'll cer- certainly stick around and we can talk. For those of you that are really interested in that, um, we can do that. But for me, I think it's more significant to make sure that we start with what is this saying about itself. And then, and then we can go, and then we can kind of go from there. So there's a number of things that I want us to try to investigate when it comes to um, how do we go about looking at, at Genesis. Um, again, I want to make sure that, that we're clear as to kind of where I'm coming from. Um, I believe that when God lays out for us his account of creation in Genesis, it's a literal six days and, uh, and then a, a seventh day of rest. And uh, I believe that it's intended for us to read it that way, and I'm going to show you some of the things as to, as to why. Uh, from Scripture and from, uh, even from, from science as well. And I believe that the flood account of Genesis 6 through 9 was a global flood, a catastrophic event that completely re- reworked uh, what our earth looks like. And the, uh, the aftermath of that event is what we're observing and what we're seeing. What we're looking at here today is the result of God's wrath. And yet there's immense beauty in it. So His mercy is woven in it as well. And God alone, right, can take things that in our mind are opposites. I can't be fully wrathful and merciful at the same time, right? And yet God does. Isn't that what he did at the cross? He poured out his wrath, but it was poured on the one that didn't need it, so there was also mercy. He takes opposites and brings them together. And, and the flood is exactly the, the same way. And, um, and so I want us to kind of walk through some of, some of those things. So first of all, um, John chapter 1. Anybody, anybody, is that their, anybody that their favorite passage of Scripture? There's a lot of people. Yeah, I knew there at least leave one person. John chapter 1, the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, right? And the Word was God, and the Word was word with God. He was with God in the beginning, and all things that have been made have been made through Him. Right? And then we get down to verse 14, that Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. So we know that that Word that is eternal is the man Jesus who came to give us life. Hallelujah. Right? Amen. So the eternal nature of Christ is proclaimed in John chapter 1, starting with verse 1, and he says that he's the word that became flesh and gave us life, and through him everything was made. So through the word, everything was made. And you come back to Genesis chapter 1, and you look at how it was created, and what does it say? Nothing came to be until what? God spoke. God spoke it, right? Now, what do we live in? Think really big picture. Like, really big picture. What do we call what we live in? The universe, universe, right? I mean, big picture. <laughs> the universe. Well, what does universe mean? Una means one. Verse means spoken word. We live in the one spoken word. And it was through the word that all things were made, and God spoke it into being. That's just cool. That's all that is. Right? That's just good stuff. All right, and so that's, that's, that's some powerful stuff. We start to process and put this together. Um, there are those, however, that have been convinced somehow in some way that evolution is a fact, that the millions and billions of years is a fact, that it's proven. And so now we've got a dilemma, because those people also believe that this is God's word. So somehow I have to try to slam the two together. All right? And so uh, there are those that will try to look for those millions and billions of years in that creation account through a variety of ideas. Some of it's called the day-age theory. All right? Everybody heard day-age theory? Okay, So the day-age theory basically, so we're all on the same page, means that those six days of creation weren't literal six days. They were long epochs of time. All right? An un, un kind of defined amount of time, but long epochs. Okay? Another is, would be called the gap theory, 
where between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2, there is again an undefined amount of time that's just there so that all these billions of years can happen and evolution can take place. And then the, the other days were, you know, were literal. All right, and all of those are compromised positions to try to take ideas that are based on the philosophy and logic of man and shove it into Scripture. But aren't we commanded not to do that? Yeah. Isn't Colossians chapter 2, verse 8 pretty clear? Do not be held captive by the shallow philosophies of this world that depend on the traditions of man rather than on Christ? Right. So why would we take, why would we take theories, unproven theories? And, and let me go on record as saying, there is nothing anywhere in any discipline of science that proves evolution or proves a world that today that they say is 4.7 billion years. It is not a fact at all. It is unproven. There's nothing. In fact, the evidence is very powerful the other direction. All right? And so we're taking an idea that's based on man observing about 3% of our world <laughs> and trying to define the other 97%. All right? And so from a compromised position, we go, well, we've got to find those millions of years in here somewhere. Where is that? Well, we're going to mess with the beginning. We're going to reinterpret Genesis. We're going to look at it again. Maybe day doesn't really mean day. You know, God did say for like, you know, in God's eyes, a day is like a thousand years, a thousand years is like a day. So maybe day doesn't, doesn't mean that. Maybe that's it. Or, or perhaps, you know, there, there's a, there seems to be a little bit of a hesitation, so to speak, or a, a, some people would say a slight stutter in the speech between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2. And, and so maybe there's a gap there. That allows for evolution to take place because, it, you know, evolution's proven. It, it, it's, it's, we've observed it. No, we haven't. But we've got to try to find that somewhere in there, okay? So, so maybe that's it. But none of them make sense, right? And they don't work. And just like we've been talking about, all they're doing is starting to mess around with the cornerstone, Christ himself, of a foundation of our life. And everything else is crumbling. Everything else is crumbling. In Genesis chapter 3... The serpent was crafty, right? Came up to Adam and Eve, and he, all he did was pose a question. I mean, come on. It's just a simple little question. Right? The serpent just said, did God really say? Did he really say you were going to die? Did he really say? And it wove in a thread of doubt. Right? And through that one man came sin, and through that sin has come death. Well, that same question is being woven into the church today. And into the hearts and minds of many believers today. Did God really say he created it all in six days? Hasn't science proven God wrong? Did God really say, you know, did God really? It's the same question. And um, what, I'm, what I want, I think you're going to see in the next few moments as we spend time together, I think what you're going to see, I truly believe you will, is evolution is a direct attack on the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's a direct attack. And to try to put billions of years into the creation account is a direct attack on the gospel and should not and cannot be tolerated if we're going to hold to the power of this. So what does this say about Genesis? If you have a Bible with you, let's go to the book of Exodus for a moment. It's one of the things that has been said to me before as I've talked to people about this. Is they're like, you know, John, you put too much emphasis on God's word. <laughs> yeah, that always makes me laugh. So <laughs> I'm like, well, I'm going to do it on his, not yours. That's for sure. So, and, and some of their critique is, well, that's because you see God used human authors. So there's room for error because there's, there's humans involved. And so there's, there's room for error. And I, I'm like, okay, all right, I'll roll with you for a little while with that. But, but aren't there places where God didn't do that? Where it's God direct? Who, who was the ones that carved the Ten Commandments into the stone tablets? Did God use a human for that? No, it's God's own voice, wasn't it? God's own word. Well, what does God say in Exodus chapter 20, starting in verse 11, when he's talking about the command to remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy? God says this. He says, remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son, or daughter, nor your manservant, or maidservant, nor your animals, nor the alien within your gates. And then here's an important word, for. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. 
8 and 9 and 10 give us the command. Remember the Sabbath day. Right? 10 and 11 give us the reason for it. What did he say? He appealed. The blueprint for your six-day work week and rest the seventh is the creation, the week of creation. He said, four in six days I created, and then I rested on the seventh. So if we're going to interpret the six days of creation as long epochs of time, we would have to say here that God is saying, you need to go work for six million years and then rest for a million. You follow me? <laughs> I wouldn't make it through the first six. <laughs> All right? It just doesn't matter. And that's God. God, there's no human involvement there. That's God saying it. That's God. He's appealing to that creation week as the blueprint. Saying, this is, this is what I did. Therefore, you're going to do the same thing. And here's the command of how to, how to do that. That's pretty powerful. That's pretty powerful. One of the things that um, also that I like to point people to when, we start, when they start to try to mess with the foundations of God's word is, as I go to Revelation chapter 21 and 22, and, uh, and you go, wait a second, that's the end. That's not the foundation. That's, that's not Genesis. No, but it all ties together. Because in Genesis chapter 21 and 22, at the beginning of each of those chapters, there's a discussion of, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And so I like to ask people, so how long is it going to take God to make the new heaven and the new earth? Yeah, that's what everybody says. And so I say, well, then why did it take him a billion years to make the first one? I sure hope he doesn't take 4.7 billion years to make the second one. I don't want to wait that long. Right? If we can believe that he's going to do that in an instant, then why do, why do we have such a problem accepting the miraculous nature of an instantaneous earth in the first place? Let's go back to Jesus again. We already laid the foundation of, of John chapter 1, Right? In the beginning was the Word, through Him everything was made. Through that Word everything was made. That Word then became flesh and, and made His dwelling, literally means pitched His tent. I love that. I'm comfortable in a tent. So He pitched His tent among us, right? And so that's what He did. So this Jesus, the God Himself, come in the flesh, well, He did pretty, some pretty incredible things while He was here, did He not? Well, let's go back to the Gospel of John again for a while. I've already got the foundation of the, the eternal nature of Christ. And he comes in the flesh. Well, then we get to John chapter 2, and we have this, we have this party going on at this wedding. Right? And Jesus changes water into wine instantaneously in the front of a whole bunch of witnesses. Now, there's an awful lot of difference between water and wine. <laughs> That's molecular change. That's not just a little bit of a transformation. That's not just some Kool-Aid powder. Right? I mean, that's a complete change. That is something from nothing. That's an absolute creating in an instant in front of, that's creation of something in front of people. I mean, that, that's incredible. So now, how many people believe in here that, that was, that's just a, a, a kind of a, a story to present a spiritual truth? Now, how many people think that's a true miracle? That really did happen. Yeah, absolutely. Well, if he can do that, well, why wouldn't he be able to, cre- that same God, create instantaneously the life that we have now? Go to John chapter 6. John chapter 6, Jesus and, the, and, his, and his buddies, the disciples, they're out there and they're teaching and all these people, 5,000 men plus, are sitting on this hillside. And Jesus says, hey, they're hungry. <laughs> and the disciples are like, so? <laughs> all right. <laughs> He's like, well, feed them. And they're like, well, we don't have anything to feed them with. And well, a little boy comes along and, and he's like, well, I got, I got this. You know, and Jesus says, get away, that's too small. I can't do anything with that. No, he didn't do that at all. With gratefulness, he grabs it celebrates it, holds it up, says, thank you, Father, for this, and takes a small, tiny meal, and from nothing feeds over 5,000 people. Just a spiritual story or a true historical account? True historical account, that happened. That's a creation, right? John chapter 9, you have a man who was born blind. Based on, based on things and details around the story, this man was probably in his late 30s, maybe in his 40s, He's been blind his entire life. Never been able to see. Jesus makes his eyes work. But what else is that guy able to do instantaneously? Identify everything he sees. How does he know what a tree is? He's never seen one before. In that instant, God didn't just make his eyes work. He programmed an entire brain. Completely, in a moment. So that he understood everything that he was seeing. Because, I mean, think about it. How frustrating would that be? I can see now, but I ain't got a clue what I'm looking at. 
I mean, that'd be, that'd, be, that'd be a little frustrating. I may want to go back to be blind again. That'd be freaky. But he programmed the brain instantaneously. We believe all these to be true historical accounts, that these miracles really did happen. And yet we then all of a sudden get back to our beginning and go, yeah, but he didn't do it all. You know, he didn't make everything instantaneous because our world's proven to be 4.7 billion years old. And evolution is a fact. Therefore, I've got to find it here somewhere. You know, no, it's not at all. In fact, and this, is, this may be the, the most um, powerful thing out of all of it. It is, it is in my heart. At least I know that. Not only do we have all these issues that we've just been talking about just from Scripture with trying to put billions of years and billion years in evolution into the count, but let's think about this for a moment. The only reason you try to find the billions of years in the creation account is to allow time for evolution because you think that's what created everything. Whether you want to attribute the credit to God or not, a theistic evolutionist, all right, or not, but you're still saying that's, that's why you put the millions of years in there. But now let's take for a moment and let's take a look at what does evolution say about life and death and what does God's character and God's word say about life and death? Evolution. The theory of evolution says that death is the advancement of all things. It's what allows us to move forward. It's the mechanism of advancement. It's the mechanism of improvement. Get rid of what is weak. Get rid of what can't survive. Let only the things that are strong survive so that we can continue to advance. That's, that's what death is. And life is all about getting rid of what is weak so that we can move on to what is strong through the mechanism of death. That's evolution. Everybody okay with that? We good? Now what, is, now what does the Bible say about death? It's the punishment of sin, isn't it? Romans, 1 Corinthians, look at the Genesis chapter 3, and what happens? The curse and everything. The result of sin is death. Before sin, there was no death. There was perfect harmony. There was perfect unity. And then sin comes along, and death is the penalty and the punishment for sin. For as through one man came death, through one man, the second Adam, Christ, will come life. Right? So if I put evolution... And billions of years into the creation count, I have billions of years of death and disease and deformity before sin. If death and disease and deformity exist before sin, then it can't be the punishment for sin. You with me? And if death isn't the punishment for sin, I don't need a Savior to die for me. All that Jesus did on the cross just got cheapened. Why would God come in the flesh and die a physical death if that's not what the payment was. You guys paid $5 for lunch, or breakfast, sorry. Right? You didn't pay more than that. You didn't pay less than that. Why did you pay $5? Because that's the price. Right? You pay what the price is. Why did Jesus die a physical death? Because that's what the price was. So if you put evolution and billions of years in the creation count, you've just attacked the gospel. You've just cheapened the cross. And all because, all because we think that evolution and billions of years are proven. Because some idea of man, Colossians chapter 2, we warned about, and we said, okay, we're going to come and we're going we're to shove this in here somewhere. And it doesn't fit. It just doesn't work. Before I step on from, from this, has anybody got any questions, yeah, buts, wonderings, thoughts? That I, can, that I can help with. I want you to process this a little bit. It's so huge. And we can deal with all kinds of science stuff. But i got to be honest with you. There isn't a scientific fact out there that's going to sway a skeptic. All right? The heart of a skeptic is a skeptic. You answer one question, there's another question. All right? And that's not to diminish the science side of it. It's huge. It's important. It's significant. And it unbelievably validates what we've just been talking about. But before we deal with any of that kind of stuff, this is what we really need. As God's people... We've got to understand what we're talking about here with God's Word. And so, are there questions or thoughts or even just reactions to that that anybody would like to throw out here? Amen. Dinosaurs. My thought on dinosaurs? I do. What's my thought on dinosaurs? They're big and they were scary. Next question. No. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> Yeah, I'll get to you in just a second. Let me actually honestly answer this question. Um, dinosaurs were on the ark. 
Dinosaurs were a part of the creation week. Uh, there are many animals. We highlight dinosaurs, but there are many animals that have not survived <laughs> since post-flood. The post-flood world was uh, catastrophic. Uh, warm water creates massive weather, right? We have hurricane season in the fall for a reason because the oceans have been warmed up all, all summer long. All right, so you've got an entire globe covered in incredibly warm water. Probably on the average, our oceans today are on average 39 degrees Fahrenheit. Back then, during the flood, probably in the area of 86 degrees Fahrenheit based on the fossil record. So you've got massive volcanic activity as well. Uh, over in Flagstaff, where I'm from, you've got the San Francisco Peaks, and uh, that's all volcanic range of mountains. And uh, Humphrey's Summit is 6, 12,633 feet, and I've stood on the top of it a number of times. And from up there, you can see over 1,400 extinct volcanoes. Uh, on, the north, on the northwest rim of Grand Canyon, there's over 1,200 extinct volcanoes. That's just that area. All right, and so the post-flood world was, was rough. <laughs> and uh, most of our dinosaur fossilized that fossils that we find and discover uh, most, not all, are, are really buried in a mixture of mud and ash. And the post-flood world just didn't, didn't play nice with them and uh, had a hard time surviving. But the average size of a dinosaur is the size of a sheep. All right? God didn't have to bring a big dinosaur on the ark. He just had to have a kind. He just had to save the kind. And so we have no reason not to believe. Uh, archaeologically, you can find all over the world pictographs of dinosaurs. So the idea that uh, dinosaurs predate man by 300 million years is, is pretty bogus. Uh, it's a theory that's out there based because it has to in order to fit some of the other, some of the other ideas. Yep. Um, but the evidence doesn't, doesn't bear witness to that. Does that help? Cool. Why did you answer it then? Yes. You had a question back here. Correct. I do not believe in evolution, but I do believe in an old age theory. Sure. I heard Dr. Ross speak, and I believe a lot of what he says. And he does marry kind of the science and, and, and the Bible together, and a lot of what he says makes sense to me. I, I don't really think it should divide. Those are not things that divide. I think should be dividing the church as to whether it's old age or new age, you know, or young, age, young earth or old earth. You know, evolution is definitely the issue that, you know, I don't think you can be a Christian and believe in evolution. I don't think you can, you can still be a Christian and believe in an old earth theory. But it doesn't really matter, really, does it? I love the question, and I appreciate it immensely. Um, and, I'll, and I agree, uh, I agree wholeheartedly with you. Um, that, you know, I understand that um, the test to get into heaven is not, do you believe in an old earth or a young earth? Totally believe that. Totally agree. Uh, there's going to be people that believe both sides of that, that are fully saved and, and are going to be in heaven, with, without a doubt. I don't like to say... Therefore, it's not a salvation issue. Uh, quite honestly, I don't even like that phrase. Because uh, anything that keeps me from embracing Christ isn't a salvation issue. <laughs> so, I don't like the terminology there. Um, but does it matter? Yes, I do think it matters. Um, do I think it should divide? No, I don't think it should divide. I have plenty of dear brothers and sisters in Christ that, that I don't agree with in this area. And I don't feel divided from them. Right? Um, and so I agree wholeheartedly it shouldn't divide. However, I do think it matters, um, and I think it matters from the angle of what are we doing with the gospel message. And, and how, in my opinion, um, how Hugh Ross goes about wrestling with some of those old earth ideas and theology, I can't, I can't go with, I can't buy with. Just, I just wouldn't. Now, no way is that me judging him as unsaved, or not at all. Or, or would that mean that I can't, have fellowship with him. I've met him numerous times. I don't have, I don't have an issue with that. Um, but I, I, can't, I can't come in line with some of the, what I would call hermeneutical gymnastics that he does to try to make that age and scripture come together. We just don't need it. There's no need for the age. There's nothing, there's nothing about our world that proves an old earth. It's all assumptions and theories. There's nothing proven or fact about it. And we can discuss why that if we need to. Um, and, and we don't need it. Um, we, there's, there's no need for it. So again, I look at why would we even take something that's unproven, uh, unfounded, it's a theory, based on human traditions. Not, I mean, there isn't anybody that I know of, and there isn't anybody throughout history who has read God's word and from God's word got thousands of millions of years, I mean millions of billions of years. It's every, I've asked every single person I've ever asked 
Um, and so I'm not going to say it's uni universal on all people, but all people that I've talked to, and it's been a lot, that, that hold to an old earth, I've asked, is it because you think when you read Genesis chapter 1, it says billions of years? Or is it because you think something outside of Scripture has proven it, and now you're trying to, to find it? And from my experience, and maybe it's different for you, um, it's been universal. Every, everybody's answer has said, well, it's something outside. Can I just ask another question? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yep. They don't. Many of them don't realize that until we start to lay things out. And mo I mean, most people don't realize that there are marine life fossils on the top of the Himalayas. <coughs> all right. It's um. It's it's all you know. All those layers that are exposed in Grand Canyon are marine sediments, and they're full of marine life. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. See, and that's, again, an interpretation of the genre of the literature. And I think the literature genre of Genesis as a whole is not poetic. Um, and Right. Yeah. Uh, part of academia believes that. Not all of academia believes that. All right. Yeah, I would probably agree with that. Yep. Um, I, I, I don't. I, I think there's definitely a relationship. Um, you look at the Bible in its world. And um, I've got to be careful with this illustration because there's, there's issues with it. But Christ himself, right, was fully God and fully human. I don't get that. I don't understand how one, I, that does, I don't have logic for that. How can you be 200% of something, right? He was fully God, he was fully human. The Bible mimics that in a lot of ways as the word. Um, I believe it's 100% infallible the word of God, but it was written in the context of humanity. And so there's human, there's human qualities to it. Um, and, and so I think we see some of that. And I think some, sometimes we have the tendency of that is how do we, where do, we, where, where do those lines come together? Where do, where do we find that? And I don't know exactly where that line is. Much like um, I shared yesterday, um, you know, there's, there's a relationship between the supernatural and the natural in creation and in the flood. Where exactly is that line? I, I, don't, I don't know exactly. God supernaturally started the flood. God supernaturally, you know, created, created the world. But he predominantly used natural processes so that we have natural testimony. And, and I don't feel like I have to necessarily find exactly where that line is. Um, and, you know, there are those that will emphasize the human nature of this and go, well, this was simply a reaction to the other, to the other peoples and other cultures. Um, and there are those that say, no, it's, it, it, it reflects that because it's written by in, in, in a context of humanity. But it's, but it's separate. And... Um, and I don't think if you take Genesis as a whole, it's, it's supposed to fit in a poem or poetry genre. It doesn't match. There are pieces of it that would match that, but not as a whole. And, and so, I, I, you know, I don't, um, so I don't have a problem with that. Yeah, that's the significant part. Agreed. Agreed. Yep. Agreed, and I by no means, our ministry is not set up, my life is not set up to try to make this an issue that divides. All right? But I do think it's an issue that's so significant and important that we need to be engaging it. And we need to be talking about it with one another and having this kind of dialogue and discussion. And um, instead of just going, that's too, tr that's too problematic. I don't want to deal with that. That can just cause problems, that can cause, that's going to cause fights, and so we're going to move on, we're not going to deal with it. And I don't think that's appropriate either. And... Um, so, so I appreciate the question. Yeah. When did um, God put on your heart to go in this direction, or just like with your obvious science and background? And yeah. When did you come to faith and was like, "Hey, Lord, and I want you to do this and meld this together as much as you know the Holy Spirit can do." 
Right. Yeah, let me, um, I'll, just, I'll try to do the short answer to that. Um, when I was six years old, my dad took me on a, on a camping trip. And um, we didn't have any gear, equipment whatsoever. We just laid a clear piece of plastic over some sticks, called it a tent. And um, it, it immediately instilled a passion in me for the wild. I sleep better when I'm outdoors than I do in my own bed. I mean, I just, that's, that's where I live. Um, and, uh, and so uh, the wilderness has always been home for me. And uh, I grew, my father was a pastor. I grew up in a, in a, in a preacher's home. And, um, and so God's, God's creation has always been powerful with me. And when I, actually, when I was growing up, I had pretty much decided I was going to be a mountain ranger in British Columbia. That's what I was going to do once my sports career was over. That's what I was going to go do. And um, ironically, while I was in Canada uh, is when God called me to ministry. And I had a terrible attitude about it. I'm like, this is the worst thing you could possibly do to me, God. I don't understand why you're doing this. I'm going to end up in some stuffy, stuffy, stupid little Bible college, and I'm going to end up in a church and deal with church politics and blah, blah, blah. I had a terrible attitude. Um, but God was doing that to equip me for ultimately what was he calling to. In 1999, um, he made it clear that, that uh, my wife and I, Kathleen, um, she and I were, started this ministry called Glory View and really start to to uh, investigate God's world uh, more specifically, more closely. Uh, God is an unknowable God in and of himself, but he's made himself known. And he's made himself known through this, and he's made himself known through creation. He came in the flesh. And so as believers, we have, you know, you go to Bible college, or if you go to places, you have, and even in your churches, a lot of times you have like Bible study methods classes, you know, and we're, we're, we're eager to do that. Help people understand how to read this, how to do this. But as Christians, we should be the most passionate scientists on the planet. You know, because that's also the other, that's, that's just as significant. We should know what we're looking at and what we're seeing and what's going on and how is God revealing himself in that. And, and, um, and so God challenged me in that. Um, and, and I started walking down that path, and, and ultimately that path has led to where I am here today. That's the short version. Giving God all the credit for it. Yeah. Right. So you know that makes no sense. He can't create something I'm old. Saying. Well, did he create Adam as an infant? I don't think so. He could have. Well, did he create him as an embryo? What, what, what is new? And your wine illustration is an excellent uh, example. Mm-hmm. You're in wine country. Yep. What is wine? It's old. It's old. Mm-hmm. He created something old when he turned the water into wine. So if the earth is old, the way I've resolved it is he created the earth old. Right. Yeah, it's... Um, Dick, that's way too deep. Come on. <laughs> no, it's, 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 on. it's good, and it's, it is. It is. It's, it's really good, and, and here's, I've gone there with some people. I've got a really good friend of mine back in Minnesota who, who we've gone round and round on these things, and, um, and we came to this kind of a, an idea and this discussion and he instantly got angry, and, um, and he just got disturbed. And his name's Jefferson, and I'm like, Jefferson, what's the deal? And he's like, well, if that's true, then God's a deceiver, because God's deceiving me. God's, God created something young to look old. Now, how am I supposed to trust God in anything? And um, again, a skeptic heart, right? You answer one question, there's another question. It's the heart of a skeptic. All right, there's no wingdingers out there that just <laughs> end the deal. It's the blood of Christ and the Holy Spirit. Um, and so um, as a result of that, we discuss that theory often with people. We kind of couch it a little differently. Again, not to try to be, to mess with semantics or to be deceitful, but to try to understand and, and, and be sensitive and gentle with that heart. And so rather than necessarily saying God making something appear to be old or making something old, and, you know, as, as you're saying. But we say he made it complete and functional, fully functional. He made a com- fully functional earth. He made a fully functional atom. Um, you know, and, um, and so it, it removes the deceit nature 
from that a little bit, but it's the exact same idea. To some degree, it's just semantics. But you're absolutely right. Great illustration. Nick, you're anointed. That's all I can yeah. say. <laughs> I'm annoying, I'm he just annoying. said you're annoying. Yeah. Come on now. That is good. Why yes. not make it all a, a timeless entity? A meaning that it, why dwell, delve into the, the old age earth? What is the old age earth and the new age? Let it be a timeless entity. If you looked at it in a scientific realm, infinity is neither time started or right. ended, right? If you all are scientifically inclined, look at it as an uh, finite, infinite uh, uh, presumption and, and make this whole realm of ours be a timeless, simple entity. That's how I would understand it. Yeah, I mean, I understand what you're saying. Um, unfortunately, there's time restraints on us, and we're not infinite, and we're very finite, and our world is finite, and we're told that it's finite, so we have to try to, that we have to, try to, to understand then what is, what, how does that work, and, um, and what are we doing. And again, we don't want to miss, um, we don't want to miss the significance of, of the point, right? And, and get muddled into, into ideas that are going divide, to divide us by, by no means. But yet, ultimately, we've got we've to wrestle with where we are and who we are and understanding how God's revealed himself. We're, we're running out of time this morning, so, so I, I can certainly stick around and chat with people as long as we need to, but I, know I don't want you guys to feel like you're being rude and having to get up and go. So, um, so, um, but, so I'll kind of wrap it up, and if anybody wants to sit around and chat with me for a while, that's, that's certainly fine. And, and um, so thanks for letting me come and visit with you guys. And um, I'll just have a I'll just have a quick I'll just have a quick prayer, if you guys don't mind. Father, you're so good, and we just thank you for your mercy and grace and for the love that you've showed upon us. And uh, Lord, this day belongs to you, not to us. So use us for your uh, advancement of your kingdom. Uh, grant us the wisdom and energy we need to, to do the things in a way that honors you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.